And that love of God, we experience it when we gather together to receive his word, when we praise together, and when we pray. And I wonder if that's the kind of shock, the kind of, and when I mean shock, I mean like the, a positive shock, not like a bad, like, oh my gosh, this is so, you know, horrendous, not that kind of, like the shock that's like, oh my goodness, that, that sense of awe in front of God's mercy and love towards me. This is the feeling, this is a kind of experience we should have, a supernatural, what we would say in our church, a transcend, transcendent feeling when we meet others, we worship together, and when we pray. So how can we get towards here? So when we do these acts things, uh, when I, as I go through acts with you all, we're going to go through it as I introduce topics that are found in the book of Acts in each chapter. And as we uh, go through them, it'll be a good time for us to uncover uh, the mysteries that God has prepared for us within his living and active word. So if you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 26, you see the disciples who gathered together in one heart. In Korean, we say, in shim, what one heart. So what were these disciples feeling after they met the resurrected Christ and he ascended into heaven? What were they feeling? Probably some kind of fear, nervousness, some kind of wandering, because they asked him. And we'll get into this later, but Lord, or before, they said, is this a time where you will restore the kingdom to Israel? So even now, even after meeting the resurrected Christ, even disciples, they have their thoughts on the fleshly, earthly things. But Jesus says, you will wait for what the Father has promised you, and you will receive power, and you will become my witness to the ends of the earth. So in that one heart, in the prayer that Jesus Christ gave them, they gathered together. We say this often. When we give our seven partisan, seven journeys, seven guidepost prayer, we often say, I always say this. It's what Jesus Christ gave to us. It's in the scriptures. He said, you will wait and you will receive power. And the, and the disciples gathered together with that prayer in waiting and enjoyment. So in the midst of that, Though they may have been a little bit scared and nervous or wandering, they were p probably very excited to see what works God has prepared for them. Remember, this wasn't a time where it was easy to be Christian. This was a time where being Christian meant you're ostracized, you're persecuted. And when I say persecuted, like actually persecuted. You know when people say, I'm starving to death? No one's starving. No, I don't know anyone who has starved to death. I'm not talking about that exaggerated hyperbole. I'm talking about persecution for what it actually means. People who try to attack, destroy, and kill you, just be, and you didn't do anything to them. That's persecution. They're experiencing persecution, and they still gather together in oneness to pray. Those who gathered in Mark's upper room were those who loved Christ in one heart, and they're having one heart and them having one heart is what you call the church. <clears throat> Everyone, we've been gathering together like this for a long time, for a few years now. And every time I see our sisters, Cindy, Julie, and Sue, Kim Yun Sue, and our brother, uh, Mr. John Logan, and all of you here, when we gather like this, I'm very thankful in front of God. Every time, because we're gathering in one heart. You all don't get anything from, we're not like paying you, you're not like getting some certificate certifications, you're not, I'm not teaching anything also, right? I'm not an educator, it's not like you're learning things and taking notes from me, like, okay, what? The, we're just sharing God's word. This is what you call a church, those who gather together in one heart to pray together, to receive God's, and to confirm the answers that God has given to us through his scripture together. And that's why even to this day, we are experiencing works of evangelism where God is using us to bring people to salvation. If you think about it like this, out of all the billions of people who have, who do, and who will ever exist, only so very few of us will ever receive salvation in Christ Jesus. That It's a tremendous, you know, we taught people like dream about winning the lottery. And when I mean dream, like physically dreaming their brains about winning the lottery. I'm sure you've all had those dreams too, right? And people think, we're so lucky if we win the lottery. Friend, this is something that can't be measured in dollars and cents, our salvation. It's eternal. It's, and even if you tried really hard and 
Calcu- there's a movie where there's a couple who beat the, like, what is it, the Massachusetts or Connecticut uh, um, lottery. They made a movie out of it with Brian Cranston as a lead. They figured out how to cheat the lottery system. So if they buy enough tickets, they eventually win every single time. It's not like that. We can't calculate our salvation. There's no amount of, like, worldly knowledge or effort that would ever get us there. It's just God's grace. That is precisely why when the disciples gather together in one place to pray and receive God's word, there needs to be a sense of awe, like a good spiritual shock in me, that I'm able to receive God's word like this. I mentioned this last week, everybody. The world, if they saw that what we're doing like this, week after week after month after year, they'd be thinking we're stupid and crazy and idiots. But for those who are saved, this, the way of the cross, his word, it is the power of God. You could have peace summits and software engineers gathering together. You know, as an IT person who works remotely, and we have another sister back there who does it too, we have so many meetings every day, executive meetings, IT meetings, senior meetings. They're all a waste of time. Nothing gets accomplished. It's a bunch of trash talk and useless nonsense, same thing over and over again. We're not, we're not wasting time here. We're not gathering together to pray about, God, please give us this and give us that. Please let us have good lives and be blessed so we can have houses and cars and clothes and good food and travel and do vacation. We're not gathering to do those things. We are only gathered for the biblical reasons, just like it shows in Mark's upper room. In Acts chapter 12, a 1, verse 12 through 26. In one heart, they gather together to pray. That is a church. It's not a gathering of reluctant, faithless people. It was a gathering of those who loved Christ and staked their life for Christ. It wasn't a gathering of hate and despair and evil motives, trying to conquer another nation. It was a gathering of of those who love Christ in order to save others who don't have Christ. At this uh, gathering, it wasn't like a discussion or some kind of debate. It wasn't to have seminars or swap theories about how should we do things. It wasn't that. It wasn't to organize a political system to overthrow the Roman government. It was nothing like that. They gathered just to pray, holding on to the promises of Christ. That was a gathering. That is, everyone, that is this gathering right here. What, what else would you be here for? All these meetings and gatherings in the world, all these protests, organizations, it's all Satan's strategy, keeping them distracted, keeping them fighting each other, locked away in false ideologies, false truths, so they would be blind to the gospel. That's not what we're having here, everybody. We're having one heart in prayer. And another, it's the second topic we look at in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 26 is obedience. That is a disciple, everybody. Moving when told not to will lead to problems. Doing whatever I want will lead to problems. But when we obey the voice of God, we experience and confirm great heavenly works and miracles. That's the truth. I'm a witness of that. It's because I used to live however I wanted. And we have others here who also do the same things. But living how you want isn't just me doing whatever I want. Living to the beat or the standard of human beings is still living however I want. So if I'm living in order to please my earthly masters or my earthly family or my earthly spouse, children, whatever it might be, that's still living according to how I want. When we obey the voice of God, heavenly miracles, thronely miracles, eternal works take place. That's because obedience is our greatest faith. It's our greatest action devotion. If you look in the scriptures, Samuel tells Saul, who tried to live his own walk of faith, thinking I'm doing the good thing in front of God. And Samuel told him, you have sinned against God. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. Because he thought, I'm going to give God the best thing. I'm going to disobey the voice of the Lord because I think I know what God wants better than what God wants. Do you, does that make sense? 
I know what God wants better than what God wants, so I'm going to do the best thing. And he said it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Where even now, God speaks to us through our spiritual leaders. He speaks to us through our pastors. He speaks to us through our senior leadership in order that we might not live according to my own standard and my own ways, but according to the voice of God. Do you know why? Because our spiritual leaders don't gain anything. They have no hidden motives. I was telling one young remnant today, she's in a terrible relationship with an unbeliever. And I told her today, I was like, you know, in Korean relationships, you call your boyfriend, who's typically older than you, that's how most Korean women date upwards, they call him oppa, right? And I said, that oppa that you have doesn't care about you. I said, like, I'm the only oppa you know that actually cares about you. When the bad thing happens, he's not going to help you because he can't even help himself. And I told her, what do I gain from it? Oh, by the way, she's my family, so it's not like I have a secret, like, a mad love for another girl. She's my cousin. I, I don't, that's weird. I told her, I was like, I'm your cousin. I don't gain anything from you from breaking up with him or coming to church. You're not doing, you're not even nice to me. You don't say nice things to me. You don't treat me good. You don't do anything really that much, anything really in your life at all. But why do I care so much about you? What do I gain from you coming to church and Restoring a life of faith. Oneness in God's word. Perfection of God's power through Christ Jesus. That you and I, we can go together in world gospelization to save our next generation, to save this church, and to live our one and only life glorifying God. Because it's too late when you're dead. And I told her that. Don't be obedient to my voice. Listen to God's voice. And that's why it took me a long time, but even my, our assistant pastor, Grace Park, it's harder because she's also my mother, right? It's, it makes it a little bit difficult. It was hard to obey. But as I get more spiritual, it's not like I became a better son, because I'm not, I'm not a better son. It's, I became more spiritual, and I'm not hearing my mother's voice. I'm hearing God's voice telling me what is the best way for you to stand as a witness in front of others. Because I'm not going to come with my own standards. I live according to God's standards. She has no other motive. It's like the same for one another. When people ask to counsel with me, or when I ask to counsel with others, what do we gain from one another other than a heart to pray and to love and forgive one another? And in there is hidden the treasures of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you can give your devotion and your greatest faith in obedience to God's voice, everyone, it might seem like you're wasting time, but you're not. So we call something holy waste of time. It's a waste of time, but in holiness. But in our church, we call it something else. We call it waiting, kidarin. You're not wasting time. You might be waiting there. Look, if you have to wait, but you don't know where you're going or what you're waiting for or who you're waiting for, it's a, waste, it's a waste of time. That's a waste of time. But when you're waiting, enjoying God's word in prayer, it might look like a waste of time, but it's a holy waste of time. It's to prepare me to have the proper setting, to build a correct partisan and have the right platform, the right imprint rooted in nature in order to go out in true obedience in the missions field. But we have to have this obedience even today. And if there is somebody in your church or in your life that makes you have a conflict about this, believe this. God has given you the best, the best opportunity to that person. Because if we're thinking, God, please take this person away so my life will be easier, how will you ever share the gospel in the missions field? There are all kinds of crazy people out there. People who will persecute you, people who will try to kill you, people who, try, who hate you and slander you. If we can't handle the people right next to us, especially our family members, right, our relatives, people at church, if we can't see them as a blessing, if we can't see them as an opportunity for answers, renewal, do you think you're really being obedient to God's voice? Do you think there's true love in me to love one another? This is something to think, think about. So as you go deeper in your obedience to God, 
not religiously, not forcefully, but by simply waiting in prayer as you gather together in oneness, then you will experience the amazing works that's found in the scriptures. Because our life has to model that, has to mirror the scripture. And it's not like you have to eventually, as you go into more spirituality and prayer, it's not like you have to force yourself. It just becomes part of your life, and you enjoy doing these things. So we pray, number three, waiting for the Holy Spirit. But what is one of the biggest problems we have when we pray? What's one of the biggest problems that we can encounter when we pray? Our prayer gets distracted, right? So, like, let's just say, for example, that there's a representative prayer, and the elders praying, and you start thinking about something else. <laughs> now, what am I going to eat today? <laughs> oh, that person at the church, they looked at me the wrong way. <laughs> well, that's our, one of our biggest problems with prayer. And everyone, that's just one example. Do you know what else is a good example of a distraction of your prayer? You sit down, and you're ready to pray. Oh, that's right. I got I to gotta pay my bills. Oh, that's right. I got to go feed my dog or... My stupid dog gets medicine. Oh, I got a ticket. That's a distraction in my prayer. Sitting in the seat of worship, everyone, this is the truth. When you're sitting to worship God, you should be praying the entire time. The entire time I'm hearing the pastor deliver the message, which is God's voice to me, I should be in prayer the entire time. God, what is your word? What are you trying to tell me? But we often think about something else. We're often trying to do something else. And our attitude in prayer, we find excuses. It's our attitude is about us finding excuses to not pray, not to wrestle in our prayer. And then there's a lot of times where it's dangerous because in, our, you know, in the gospel, everything's okay, right? Everything is okay. It truly is. But some people take that so extremely, they're like, it's okay if I didn't even pray. It's okay, it'll be okay. Even that is a dangerous uh, line of thinking. Because you keep thinking that, one day you'll be in your 20s, 30s, 40s, still saying, hey, hey, it's okay. 50s, 60s, and then one day you'll be sick with all kinds of mental and physical illnesses and on your deathbed thinking, my goodness, what have I done? You know, our assistant pastor Grace Park said this, I can't Really, I didn't think about or feel it, because, but she's getting older, so I think she was able to say this. She said, when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to think about, oh, what's all the food I didn't get to eat? Well, all the places I didn't get to get vacation to. You're not going to think about that. When you're on your deathbed, you're going to think, all the devotion I couldn't give God when I could have in my lifetime. That's what you're going to think about on your deathbed. All the devotion, all the opportunities, all the worship and prayer, all the evangelism I didn't do when I was alive is what you're going to regret the most on your deathbed. Not what I didn't get to eat, what cars I didn't get to drive, what vacation areas I went to. That's not going to matter anyways. And you know what, everybody? I know I'm not a good witness of this because I'm not like a super rich person who's been ever. but I've traveled the world. I've been to all kinds of places. I've really traveled all over the world. I've lived in multiple countries. It's all the same. It's just eating, pooping, and sleeping. <laughs> it's the same anywhere you go. Some places look a little bit nicer. Some places look a little bit dirtier. Some places have brown people. Some places have white people. The spiritual problems that plague this earth doesn't change between culture or races or language. It remains the same everywhere. Everyone is suffering. Everyone's in pain. Everyone is lost, captive to sin, Satan, and curses, and their destiny is hell. That's it. So when you're on your deathbed, there's only one thing you're going to regret, what I didn't do in front of God for the sake of the glory of the kingdom of God. I don't think that's a life we have to live. So we pray in waiting to not lose sight of this one and only life that God has paid for. And you have to remember that. You didn't earn this salvation. You didn't buy your way into life. This life that you live isn't yours to do whatever you want with it. God paid for it. Your life belongs to God. That's the truth. Never think, I'm the master of my own life. God is the master, and you meet, we must obey his voice, not because he wants to enslave us, but because God wants to bring us into the blessing and the true joy and happiness of worship, prayer, and evangelism and missions. You know, 
there is nothing that makes me more happy. I'm, I am so unmoved by the things of this world. Like, nothing really gets me going, like, oh, like, oh well, we can do what? Like, okay, great. Like, I, I'm not physically motivated in many, like, really, in almost no ways. But when it's time to share the gospel, when I hear the works of evangelism taking place through our precious disciples and remnants, that fills me with a kind of joy I cannot describe. You all know me. I'm a hardened man. I'm a cold, my wife says all the time, you're a cold person. I don't cry. I cannot cry. I don't care. When people are like, my mother even tells me today, like, you need to be more, like, compassionate. I was like, I can't. Like, I, people are just so difficult. <laughs> like, I'm just annoyed all the time. That's the kind of cold person I am. I never, I'm, but I am always in my heart and in my own private time, when I'm not in front of anybody, moved to tears at the, at the news of our peacemakers bringing people to Christ. When I see the works of evangelism, our children coming to life in the gospel, it moves me to tears. A man like me, who's so unmoved by any real plight or difficulties, that doesn't move me. But that the, the gospel does. Life in Christ moves me through tears. Number four, uh, the Holy Spirit's working completely covers my lacking. Everything where, I'm sh- I, where I come short, the Holy Spirit covers all that. And everyone, this isn't discovered through Bible study or QT or like some kind of like seminar training. How can you be a better Christian today? Like that, that doesn't work like that. Now, I'm not saying Bible study or QT, these things are useless. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in and it of itself doesn't bring us to the works of the Holy Spirit of God. The only thing that brings me to the working of the Holy Spirit of God is Jesus becoming my Christ, becoming my reason, becoming my life, becoming my master, and then us realizing this, making a conclusion in Christ is what leads me to the Holy Spirit covering my life. And when you say it like that, It's okay if you fail, if you've come to the realization of Christ as you seek God's guidance and power and Holy Spirit. The problem is a lot of times people don't have a conclusion in Christ. They just want to do something in front of people to gain acknowledgement. The Holy Spirit doesn't cover that. He doesn't give you strength so that you can impress others physically. But when you recognize Christ and you make a conclusion there, you realize it's not about me. It's about Christ. I am weak. I am lacking. That's why I need Christ. So when you do that, when you come to that realization, Holy Spirit starts to cover things for you, your whole life. And then if you fail in the middle of that, then it's okay. Because even that failure makes me realize Christ again to keep us humble, to keep us on the right track. Number five, God who desires perfection, has entrusted evangelism to us. So we have to be the ones who are used within God's perfect plan and who are able to carry the burden and the blessing. When I say burden, I mean a spiritual gospel, a good burden. Because, you know, if you live your life without doing anything, I'm sure you've all done that before, right, where you either got sick or you're on vacation or something where you kind of just had nothing to do? Have you all had that life in your life where you just have nothing to do? How useless do you feel? Like, you're pretty useless, right? You're like, I, human beings are spiritual creations. That's why we feel motivated to do something with our lives. People who do nothing all day, every day, they are very under-motivated. They have, like, a lack of will to live. It's like, well, I'm not doing anything. It actually leads to a lot of dangerous thoughts and a lot of dangerous, sinful actions. So the burden that we get from the gospel from God is a good spiritual burden. And we have to have the vessel in order to carry that burden. We make this comparison. You know, it's like if God pours down blessings like water into a bowl, how big is your bowl? Is it the size of a bottle cap of a soda pop? You can barely put anything in there. How large is your vessel? 
because the blessing of evangelism and missions is a large vessel, requires a large vessel. And we cannot do this without receiving the Holy Spirit. We cannot live a proper walk of faith without the Holy Spirit. We cannot evangelize. We cannot love. We cannot preach. We cannot live without the Holy Spirit working in us to perfect God's plan of evangelism that he's entrusted to us. If you're a saved child of God, you've been entrusted with a mission. That's the truth. God didn't save you, so I'm going to die on the cross. Now go eat potato chips on the couch and get sick and die one day. He didn't do that. <laughs> That's not the reason why he did it. Go get a Ferrari one day. <laughs> I don't want to believe in God if that's what God was planned for us. He died in trusting you will be my witness to the end of this earth. The last point, but we do have to, I have to keep this a little bit short because I have another meaning after this. <clears throat> yearn for the Holy Spirit. When yearn for the Holy Spirit, earnestly ask God in your prayer, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Come into my thoughts. Come into my ears, eyes. Work in my lips. Work in my feet, in my hands. Move every part of me. to lead me to the way of the cross, to God's kingdom, and the place where works like wind and fire take place, where God alone receives the glory, not us. We have to earnestly seek the Holy Spirit and obey God's word through the working of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we become a dry and weary land. hoping something will come to along my way to make me feel good or make me feel happy. You know, I'm hearing that more often these days in, like, movies and shows and media. I just want to be happy. Then I'll finally be happy. I wasn't happy before, but I'm trying to get happy. Now. It's, I hear, and it's so sad. I don't, like, scoff at it. I always just get sad. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's so sad. People just seeking happiness all the time. And it, it's sad to me because I'm always happy. You know, growing up, I'm sure my family, maybe my brother, but not really my parents or my sister, no, but I was not really a happy child growing up. I was, I was like always kind of just like, like always grumpy or sad or like feeling like, and you know, a lot of times I, I kind of made it happen to myself when people were like, come on, let's play. I'd be like, I don't want to, like, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff, like, no, I'm not going to, even though I wanted to. Like, I always was just kind of a, like, kind of an angry sad person growing up as a child. I remember one time when I was like 13 or so, I remember I opened the window in my room. I started screaming out the window, help me, I'm so unhappy, I'm so bored. I don't know what, I, I must have been crazy. I remember doing that. I'll never forget that. In the, up, in the upstairs room, on the, I was on the left side of the room. I opened the leftmost window, and I was, like, screaming that outside. I was like, Am I, I must have been crazy. That's the kind of child I was. I was, like, 13 or 12 or something like that. My sister's laughing a lot over it. I don't know. <laughs> and, and that was a spiritual problem. And that spiritual problem completely healed in me as I, and I was severely depressed in college. I was, like, severely depressed. I know one of our other people here had the same issue. I was like medically depressed in college. I was like, I don't know what is my life. What am I doing with my life? I feel so guilty all the time. I feel like a piece of crap. I'm not doing anything. Always just seeking fun. And then even when I do it, not feeling fulfilled at all. Like always feeling empty afterwards. And I got so depressed. So bad to the point where I developed a mental illness. I started having a panic disorder. And then the turning point came where I was so low to the ground, I had no choice but to see Christ. And that was when the Holy Spirit started to work because I started to recognize it's only Christ who can do this for me. And I'm telling you, I'm a witness. The Holy Spirit will cover you if you recognize Christ in all things, if you come to the complete conclusion and answer. And in that, and at first it was hard because I couldn't obey. Even though I knew and it was God was guiding me, it was hard to obey but as the obedience kept coming in because of the works and the small taste of prayer answers that I began to experience, I was able to wait in prayer. And now God is opening the doors, a time schedule where he's using my life to preach this gospel, not only in our college campuses, but even in other parts of the world. 
But I'm a witness. I didn't do anything special. I didn't do anything more special than what you did in the seat of worship. I bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ so you will begin in one heart with me in obedience to God, only Christ today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your amazing grace and mercy and love for us that even in the midst of our still always lacking you still love us, and you still guide us, and you still give us your word, and you still give us salvation, and you still give us guidance in all things. Father, we pray that in this one life we have to live, it might be lived in waiting and enjoying and challenging towards saving this world that is completely lost under Satan and darkness. May this be a week where Satan is at every turn and corner, crushed under the feet of the disciples who are gathered here today. May God receive the glory, and in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you, everybody. At this time, I'd like to invite our sister, our Remnant Kelly, to come up and give the uh, a brief form about our UVA uh, uh, camp. And, and, and if Dr. Logan, or Professor Logan could also chime in uh, and, and give a little form, too, after or before, or however you guys want. I don't care. I'm just going to stand over here. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Uh, this is a report from uh, yesterday's camp. Uh, Twelve of us, including Professor Logan, uh, did camp. So uh, we split up into six teams. And there were three acceptances and three people whose contacts we received. Um, one of the people that... Uh, that accepted actually was uh, a Muslim lady, and some that and the reason why we kind of want to highlight this is because we oftentimes we actually meet a lot of Muslim people whenever we go out to camp, and they typically you know don't accept um, you know which is kind of natural. And I even have Muslim friends who you know think that you know we believe in the same God, and so what you know they just choose to follow what they you know know in Islam. Uh, so for this lady to have accepted Christ, we thought it was a very significant um, working of the Holy Spirit. And, and one thing that I would actually like to share is that yesterday, um, j just for context, I guess, uh, right before we actually were split up into teams and we went out to evangelize, I was actually not feeling so well, like spiritually, and um, like I just my heart was like th like was weighing kind of heavy, and because of things that were happening, and just you know, I, I mean, I guess just that's the kind of state I was just in. Uh, but because of that, I actually just went into prayer even more, more than I actually have. I feel like for any of the other camps up until now. And I just kept praying to God, like, God, may we be led. Um, and also, while we were walking around, it was hard to see students because it's summertime. And, and even though there are summer classes, like some students were just in class or there just weren't a lot of people in general. Uh, but, you know, I just kept praying to the very end. And one thing that happened uh, kind of um, made an impression on me is that the very last evangelism tract I shared wasn't actually even to a person. I actually left it on the windshield of a car. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because later, after we all, you know, um, we all uh, came back together, uh, Professor Logan was sharing how, you know, she thought that, you know, she wanted to share this evangelism track too and she also had the idea of putting it on the windshield but then she saw that there was already one on there and she was like oh so who did it and then and then her uh, sister Janie uh, said oh Kelly did it and and then Professor Logan then immediately followed saying you know oh we had the same heart like we had the same heart for evangelism and when she said that 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 brought about great joy in my heart just and and it, it made me see once again, like the working of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit transcends time and space. Like we didn't run into each other at all while we were on camp, when we were split up into teams.
But the fact that the Spirit gave us that same heart um, and that we were able to confirm it and that just seeing God's like amazing works that that this is all like it's not that I felt like I did a good job or anything it's just I just was so grateful to God that he would even give me this heart like just as he had to move my heart for me to even accept even when it comes to evangelism it's it's God's Holy Spirit working and and so I was just very very thankful for that um that we can have that one heart for the sake of evangelism and um yeah, I just want to glorify God. I, I mean, and th- this is all for his glory anyway, so the fact that I can live doing this uh, alongside our professor uh, and our church as well, obviously, um, I'm just very thankful. So th- that, that's all I wanted to share. Um, okay. Uh, if anyone would like to share anything at this time, uh, So, so I know the time is uh, almost uh, uh, over, but uh, you know, uh, I just want to share a very nice uh, um, the letter with you guys because, uh, um, you know, we always see a uh, sow seeds, but we don't see the fruits open, right? So I I think we should celebrate this all together. Uh, the letter from Tianwei. We had I had a, a Bible study with Tianwei. Uh, during this semester, and last last week was the last one with her because she moved out of this area, and she gave me this uh, postcard, and she said, "I just wanted to say thank you so much for this wonderful semester of Bible study. I learned so much. You probably can't imagine how much inspiration I gained every time we meet." and how much I have opened my mind and heart. After this semester of meetings, now I can confidently say that I am a follower of Jesus and that I will do my best to follow his path. I feel so lucky and fortunate. Meeting you this semester is one of God's greatest mercy and gift for me. So I think uh, this is the fruit of all of us, you know, work together, uh, working together, and I think we can celebrate this. Uh. Thank you, Professor Logan, for sharing that. Yeah, we're, we're, everybody's clapping here. We're every, we're, we're very joyful. And, yeah, th- grateful for that. Um, do you want to? Oh, do we end? No? Ah, okay. Um, it. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to share anything. Um, okay, then uh, we uh, let us end with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, we, we-